Welcome to Not So Standard Deviations. This is episode 91, and I'm Roger Peng from the Johns Hopkins Data Science Lab, and I'm here with Hilary Parker of Stitch Fix. In this episode, we're talking about the book The Creative Curve by Alan Gannett and uh, how it might apply to data science and data analysis. So we hope you enjoy our discussion. So, The Creative Curve. Yes, right. So we're uh, discussing The Creative Curve by Alan Gannett, right? Gannett, yeah, yeah. And I think I mentioned this was a true... Amazon machine learning success in that I was sort of clicking around books about creativity and design and this one came up and it was a compelling enough kind of write up that I decided to buy it and I'm very glad I did. Yeah, so that's how and I, I came across the book because you told me so. So uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a different kind of algorithm, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it's the same. That's the behavior. It's modeling. Like yes, if yes. you if you read this and it's it's that's a model that's truly based on you know expert collective action. Although sometimes actually it's kind of funny because um, one time I was I was talking to Hadley Wickham about presentations and he suggested a couple books on presentations. Uh-huh. Um, and so I went to buy them and then the suggested book was R for Data Science. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> because presumably he'd like suggested this book so often. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> So sometimes there are there odd behaviors come out because those things obvi- they have very little to do with each other. <laughs> so we we still have to validate your algorithm though. So okay, you mean by reviewing this book? Exactly right. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you want to? Since you are maybe you encountered this book first, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about why you do or do not like it? And uh, and and I'll give maybe just come overall impressions, and I'll give mine too. Yeah, sure. So I mean, I'll give like a brief my understanding or kind of my summary of the book, which is that it's essentially, it's by someone who I believe is like in marketing or something like that. He kind of gives his spiel about how he's like a data nerd uh, who, which I kind of hate that phrase, but that's sort of how he phrases it. But it sounds like he's just interested. He was, he was someone who was like very method methodological is that how you say okay, that? Yeah. <laughs> about the thing he was doing so like he talks about doing game shows and like studying the other participants and figuring out like not just trying to be the smartest person but figuring out that like the personality matters or whatever so he's just someone who approaches the world in a very behavior behavioralistic scientific type way um and so he points this sort of apparatus at creativity um and sort of like in the realm of art and marketing and all of these different things and so like you know kind of the subtitle is how to develop the right idea at the right time and i view this as like a very practical analysis of what we actually mean by creativity um such as like you know there's Creativity in some ways is defined by the audience, so you can't act like it's in a vacuum. And so kind of like how to have good ideas and how to get those ideas accepted by an audience, and then kind of analyzing the behavior of people who are deemed like good creatives in order to find themes so that he essentially lays out like kind of here are the steps to take if you want to cultivate your creative craft within a certain field. And I just found it to be so pragmatic and lots of good paradigms. Like when I was reviewing the book for this podcast, there were so many things where I was like, oh, yeah, I actually think about that all the time now. Like I've completely that's like a catchphrase in my head when I'm doing work. Um, And so, yeah, it, it was really different than some of the design thinking stuff, because the design thinking stuff was a really good way of like articulating the work in a new way that really made sense and this is more of a practical guide for how to do the work um right a little bit less designy although not yeah a little bit less designy in that it's not about like um like it can be about art you know so like something that isn't necessarily practical but you can, I mean, I think that's one of the big things, like, like designs like applied art or something. Right, right. Um, like practical art. So, so yeah, that was sort of my takeaway and why I wanted us to read it. Um, I think there's a huge amount of practical advice for data science, data science product development, um, analysis, writing, et cetera. So, so that's my spiel. Okay. And cheers. So, um, just very quickly, the, so the author is, he, I guess it says he's the CEO of TrackMaven, which is a marketing data and intelligence service. 
Okay, there you um, go. So that's just like, he's like in marketing analytics, I guess. Um, so I enjoyed reading the book. I, I especially appreciated the first, I think it's called, it basically it's part one of the book, um, where he talks about, basically part one is basically myth busting, right? He's talking about like the creative genius and how we kind of think of it in our minds and how it's actually this other thing. And in particular, it's like there is a, there's two parts right, that are critical. One is thought like the thing that the person does, the output, right? And then there's like the world in which it sits and, and how critically essential. I mean, I think essentially that's what this book is about. Like if you put place an idea in the, in the kind of in the world at the wrong time or the wrong place or whatever, like that has a very different result than putting it at the right time in the right place or whatever. So yeah, and even the same idea, right? So so I appreciated that kind of like decomposition of like, you know, the way we think of genius, the way we think of creative people depends critically on the kind of population level or kind of a context that we are currently experiencing, right? Yeah, like an example of that would just be if you took, I don't know, like some modern form of music like rap and you put it in front of 17th century people, even though right. we consider, you know, many songs to be creative genius level songs like it it would be completely incomprehensible back then exactly like yeah i mean like if you just look at you know like kendrick lamar won the pulitzer prize right Mm -hmm. that wouldn't have happened before (laughs) and it didn't happen before so it's just you know it's sorry so that i think it's kind of the thing that's like in retrospect seems obvious but it's like it's very i think insightful yeah i like that not to just interrupt your spiel a bunch but i think that's a really good way of putting it that a lot of this book was like oh yeah that makes sense like it wasn't like oh that's a totally mind-blowing new idea but he just broke it down and like you know presented studies and just laid it out in such a practical way that articulated it in a very I, I feel like I remember it all, and it's right. very actionable. Yeah. Well, I, and I think in some sense that's the application of his theory, which is that like if you want to produce something that people will enjoy, like it has to be recognizable in some way, right? And so I think part of the experience of being like, oh yeah, this all makes sense, is why maybe I don't actually, I don't really know how popular this. I assume the book's popular, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I think if, so. Yeah. If it were popular, that would be one of the reasons because when people read it, it, it makes sense to them. It kind of jives with them, right? So mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, so if it were, but if an idea were, were extremely foreign and kind of didn't make sense even after you read it, um, I think the success of that would be different, right? So. Absolutely. So I, I say now I I think I may disagree with you a little bit on the practical implications of the book. Go on. But only in part, right? So I think, so in part two of the book, he call it has like these four laws of the creative curve, right? Some of that was, I thought, useful, but some, so I think, you know, the first three I thought were quite interesting, but the, the last one, the iterations, law four, mm-hmm. I didn't get at all. Like, I didn't really understand. Hmm. Maybe you'll have to explain that to me. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, maybe let's like introduce... Let's first, I I do want to define the creative curve um, because essentially the, that idea I found to be really helpful framing and the idea when he talks about the creative curve, what he really means is that you sort of like trends follow this general, like essentially, yeah, like a a bell curve, a Gaussian distribution. (laughs) Well, the picture that he draws in the book is literally like a Gaussian curve, right? So. Exactly. Yeah, he even like says percentages sometimes that are very like clearly like one standard deviation. Right, right. <laughs> like, um, but the idea is that sort of you can think of the peak of the curve is when an idea is like he calls it the point of cliche. So you, I think about this in clothing trends for sure, where you know you have some sort of trend come in on the runways, and only the sort of fashionistas, fashion forward people sort of comprehend it i think the average person you show them runway looks and they're like what is this um and then that idea sort of gets um like as do you see fashionistas wearing it it feels more approachable to people and then you hit the point of cliche where most people recognize it and are cool with it (laughs) and then and then you start to taper off like the going down the other side of the bell curve it's like it gets kind of passe and then you become overexposed to it and then you're like okay i'm done with this and so yeah and like and like the sweet spot that he talks about is sort of at like one standard deviation above (laughs) where you like you're one of the people who has the idea that's starting to feel approachable but still feels fresh so just just to be clear, so if you're looking at like a bell curve, 
what you're talking about is one standard deviation to the left of the mean. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah, that's where you yeah. want to be. So, and I think just, and also just to be clear, the, the X axis is kind of like time or familiarity with an idea. Uh, and the y axis is the is preference right so yeah. uh, there's a at the peak of the of the curve it's like people are really really want they pref- they really prefer the idea and they're kind of they're pretty familiar with it but then as that familiarity increases even further they like actually like it less right so. yeah and he talks about like studies with songs where it's like you end up when you first hear a song frequently it's sort of like oh, okay interesting and then you s- start to love it and then eventually you are like, okay, I, I hate this song now. Right. Like I've heard it a million times. And they did studies with like undergrads where they play the same song to them a bunch or, or something like they made up Chinese characters and showed them to people and you had to see it a certain number of times before you kind of had a more positive emotional reaction to it. Um, so you can also think, I thought about this before, you can also think of the creative curve as like a population density where... Like, if an idea, if you take any, like, I don't know, cliche idea, like, he also talks about in terms of, if you look at the distribution of the population that likes, well, no, that doesn't actually work, does it? But you can think about it as, like, where, if, if there's an idea, where do you fall on the curve? And, like, if you're one standard deviation to the right of the mean, you're kind of a laggard. <laughs> like, right, right, right. Yeah. It's like jumping on the bandwagon later when everyone else is sort of over it versus right. if you're at the beginning. I guess it's like, yeah, at what point in a trend, if you take one trend over time and the y axis, the x axis is like, when did you adopt it? You can think of your, you can put yourself on the curve. <laughs> right. It'll be a distribution across the population of people. Like exactly. You, you can, like you can think of the curve either as like one person's journey over time, or you can think of the curve as like a cross section and like of like when people kind of ca- kind of catch on to the idea or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So like with te- I mean, and that one's obvious because I think everyone would know. Like, do you jump on tech the moment it comes out, or do you wait until it's like adopted? And right. It's like, are you an early adopter, or do you wait until it's essentially like forced upon you? <laughs> yeah. Or are you like a hippie who hates cell phones and like just pick them up? Right. <laughs> like, or like my parents. Who... <laughs> <laughs> are your parents are hippies? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> they got cell phones a little later in the yeah. game. Let's put that way. So anyway, yeah. So that's sort of. So I found that concept super useful. And the way I think of it is it's a really useful way to think about the audience of a product, whether that product's like, you know, a live thing on a website or an analysis where if you can place your, if you can figure out where that person is on the curve, you can figure out how far you can push them. Um, and so one example I think of is like, if you're working with people in finance who have these like super complex, like Excel sheets, you know, like when they do analysis, like, let's say your task was to try to make analyses more reproducible, you would need to make something that still kind of feels like Excel. Like if you just jump to something that is like cutting edge for you, it would be way too far from them. Right. And so there's always going to be that disconnect as an expert in analysis where what you find to be exciting to work with, like you're going to be on the very, like, you know, two standard deviations to the right of the mean in terms of your adoption time for new tech or like new analytical methods or whatever. But you can't, being a good ana- analyst and like quote unquote listening to your audience means just like figure out where they are and figure out how far you can go so that they're like, wow, you contributed something new without it being like, this is completely unus- unusable. Yeah. And I think that disconnect is like the number one problem with especially analysis. Yeah, I totally, uh, exactly. I, I, this is the exact thought that I had was that like, you know, every time I collaborate with someone or I interact with someone um, in some sort of, scientific analysis or data analysis like you know you kind of have to gauge like okay what is the kind of thing like they don't necessarily have to understand every little thing but they need to have some level of recognition right um and um whether that's a t-test or a regression model or it's machine learning or you know whatever you're going to do you have to kind of like pick that spot where it's like okay you can explain what what was done 
and they will be like, okay, I get it, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and I accept, you know, what you've done rather than like go straight to the max and it's like with some complicated approach and then and they don't know what to make of it right yeah and like probably the i feel like the reason people do that is because it's more fun for you as an analyst right exactly yeah it's new for you yeah yeah and so it's like oh like i don't want to do this boring thing that feels cliche to me because for them they're like at that point like for them their curve is like oh this is way too radical so right right it's yeah, like I, that's one of the things where when I say this is kind of paradigm shifting or things, there's things that I just think about all the time. That's that's one of the main ones where I'm just like, where is this person at and how far, like, what's their one standard deviation above or like to the right of the mean right, um, or to the left? Sorry. I think so. One example I think would be causal inference techniques, um, mm-hmm. which I don't know how much interaction you have with this kind of stuff but like i feel like that was the kind of thing that 10 years ago was like totally newfangled and very few people really talked about or even understood it you know and it was like if you went into a meeting and like said hey we, you know we did this like inverse probability of weighted you know estimator mm-hmm. people were like uh, we don't know what you're talking you know it would be like you'd be like speaking in a foreign language right so totally and yeah. uh, but now it's like everybody's doing that. yeah <laughs> you know it's yeah. like really and now i can go to that same meeting and it's like oh yeah you just did that yeah of course you did that that's what everyone does you know it's like um and it's 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 and anyway i guess if, if you if you're in a business long enough it's like it's just interesting to see, it's interesting to see these things evolve and see kind of see the curve play out not mm-hmm. in real time but over like 10 years you know um, absolutely yeah and i think you make a good point too because i think you can't act like science in general isn't is like immune to this right like we kind of act no, like science not. is immune to it but yeah like especially in the applied sciences there's just trends in terms of how to do analysis and if you want like it's more important to like if you want to p- publish like something in public health they have these like tables they make in public health that were always kind of inscrutable to me i mean i got what they were but they're like these population level kind of breakouts and like the way they present the numbers is very specific and but it's just like if you want to make an impact in the public health field like you better include a table like that and it's not because that's necessarily the best way like to visualize the data or understand it but like if you want the journal editors to <laughs> accept that like you will get a review that says can you include this table right. you know now i was gonna say, i think one of the easiest and probably most common ways of like having an impact on your field in science um is to it's just if you imagine like different like if you imagine that different fields are kind of at different places on the curve for like a given concept right so like some fields may do this all the time and some fields have never heard of it and you know it's, you know like it's to like kind of look at a field where they're like where there's like where they're kind of like at the peak of the curve and like mm-hmm. they're they've adopted some technology or they're using some method or whatever and like and figure out like where your field is and if your field is kind of like at the bottom on the left right then just kind of steal it from that one field and bring it to your field yeah and that is like that is Wait, a, the bottom and the right you mean like if your field's like a laggard no if your field is like hasn't is kind of just introducing itself to this area but not hasn't quite adopted it yet i see you know yeah. if you can steal that idea from like i don't know some other field and and kind of translate it into your field that's like a time honored repeatable uh, method for like a 10,000 citation paper you know it's like you know what you're totally right because yeah like that's a big like taking something from another field and applying it to your field is you always sound like a genius and especially if you have some level of expertise like the, the number of times that I said things like well this is something they use in clinical trials when I was doing experiment analyses. Like that was just like a perfect way. Like I could switch to, I still think for a lot of web analytics, survival analysis is actually the most appropriate thing. Cause you know, you get people enrolling in the AB tests at different times. And so you can't just like T tests, like kind of aren't right for it. That's like a whole thing. Yeah. And so like, but I could, I could succeed in that cause people have, heard of clinical trials and there's like a general reverence for them of like this is the gold standard of experimentation and so i could be like hey this is actually more appropriate and i can explain as much as it as you want but there's a level of like trust me and i think that was enough familiarity to like push people forward right 
versus and like yeah you're right it's just super time honored like you always seem like a genius and it's like wow this person's like thinking across boundaries blah 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 (laughs) which is true like it's well you are doing that yeah yeah yeah, exactly (laughs) i just think you know like you have to kind of the like your field has to be at a place where it's like looking for something and they kind of know what they want but they don't have the approach exactly nailed down and then if you show up and be like oh yeah this other field did do this thing and it's like, yes, that's what we're looking for. You know? We literally did that in this podcast with the design <laughs> thinking. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, who knows if we kind of hit it correctly in terms, of the, in terms of where we are on the curve. But yeah, that is yeah. what we did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think there's the, because it's like more data scientists are working in tech and therefore like the idea of designers is not totally foreign. I think before tech, if you'd had like... If, if like, 50 years ago, you're like, let's do what architects do, people would be like, what? Like, why? Versus now we've had exposure to designers. And and that field, I mean, has matured a ton. Like, 50 years ago, there wasn't even this kind of concept. But, um, yeah, it's, like, I think, like, having the tech connection meant that more people are exposed, including myself. And then I was like, wait, we could apply that here. And you know what I mean? Like, right. all the ingredients are there for... Exactly this. That's why we th- seem like creative geniuses, of course. Yes, because yeah. you know we're really not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but to that point, like his kind of practical advice is exactly that, right? Like, um, do you want to switch over now to like the laws? Yeah, I do want to talk about the laws. Actually, yeah. So the four, just the four laws are consumption, imitation, creative communities, and iterations. And this is like from his observations of people, here were the four main themes that came out, like of creative geniuses, quote unquote. Here was the four kind of behaviors that came out. Right. I'll just say that, I, like, so the first one, consumption, I really kind of identified with. Like, I, I felt like that is something that, like, everyone who's, like, really good, has, at least in my experience, has done. Um, like, they've read every book or they've watched every movie or they've you know, listen to every song or, you know, know, whatever it is that they're into, whatever it is that their kind of field is, you know, they really kind of consumed a lot. And that kind of made a lot of sense to me. Yeah. He talks about it being like almost 20% of your time is spent consuming in the field. Um, And like, I think the implicit thing, he probably says this explicitly, is just that you have to, you have to get where the field is in order to know where, how far you can go. Right. Exactly. Yes. In fact, I, I did highlight, I highlighted one quote, but I can't remember. It's like something like, you can't do something, I can't remember. It was something like, you can't break the rules if you don't know what the rules are. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, like you have to get a sense of like, what's the population? What's the variation within the population um, in terms of like, whatever it is that you're looking at, like whether it's paintings or whatever. And um, and you can't do that unless you like, just go out there and like, look at all everything that's been produced. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I feel like I'm just going to keep repeating myself, but this is, and this is something that, again, like, I think, I think most data scientists are probably good at this with methods. Like, that's what you see. The conference compositions reflect that, where they're, like, really excited about new methods and reading about new methods and, like, all into it. But where it falls short is being really passionate about the application um or yeah or even consuming like what are your consultants or like the people you're consulting for or the people you're building for like what what are they familiar with like people will just kind of do a cursory look at best if anything well i think this law actually exposed to uh, well it what, what i read it, it i think it exposed to me one of the critical weaknesses of learning data analysis right i think because if you wanted to, if someone came to you and said they wanted to learn data analysis, you know what would they consume? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, there there really isn't anything to consume because I mean you could read papers, you know. Well, we'll talk, I'll talk about it in a second, but like that's not really, I don't know, I, that's not like data analysis, right? That's like the yeah. presentation of, of many many things that kind of happened, all of which is hidden from view. So I think problem number one with data analysis is that there's nothing to consume. Um, well, there's very little, and I think the output that of the output of data analysis is, you know, like for example, you could argue, well, there's a lot that goes into making a movie, right? And um, 
and, and we don't see that, right? We generally speaking, we just see the finished product, right? Um, yeah. But I guess I guess I would argue, or with the song, or with a play, or a book, or whatever, you know. Like, but I would argue that you learn a lot by examining that finished product. Absolutely. And uh, I feel like for data analysis, first of all, many data analysis you never see because they happen like internally at companies or you know whatever you never see them, right? For things that are published, like then there's a complicating factor, which is that you have to understand the context of that analysis, whether it's in ecology or clinical trial or, you know, whatever, like if you don't understand that field, then I don't know how much there is to learn about data analysis from reading a paper in some random journal. Yeah. So I, this is a, I think this is a critical weakness in like teaching data analysis, right? Because we, do, we have no way, to, like if you wanted to be a writer, we could just say, go read a, like a hundred books or whatever, you know? Right, yeah. Um, and there's like an, you know, there's books everywhere, right? So, but there's no way to do this, um, or at least that I know of in data analysis to be like, go study a hundred data analyses and, you know, and look at the patterns and see what see what the range of variabilities are. I mean, I don't know. It's... Yeah. Well, no, that's that's really interesting because I think the the thought that's popping up in my head as you say that is just that you can't divorce it from context, or like divorcing it from context is like an expert level thing. And like, I mean, I think it's kind of clear at this point that my bias would be start with the application and consume all of the like a practically driven thing where you consume, let's say you're at a company. I mean, yeah, I have a big enough team of data scientists that it's like, I actually am getting a constant flow of analyses by other people within the application that I'm an expert in. And so I can kind of read those. And every once in a while, I see like a new box plot that I'm like, Oh, like I, I saw someone make a really nice kind of like, uh, like, what is it? Whisker plot or something like that. Anyway, I was like, ooh, I want to adopt that for myself. Uh And so I have a constant flow of that, but it's all kind of application driven. And then, and this would be for movies too. It's like first you study the movies and then as you get more technical, you're ready to sort of study the process more. Right. Yeah. And so trying to jump to the process is difficult or maybe even like misguided. But I think, like with you know something like movies, uh, especially nowadays, you know when you have like the technology is so you know inexpensive and advanced. Um, like if you like you you could just go make a movie, you know, and like it wouldn't be good, uh, <laughs> but you would cap. You, I mean, you could you could watch like a professional immediately made movie and see and see like they did this and they you know they have actors and they have like you you, you could kind of look break down the various pieces of it. Um, and and then try to replicate it on your own. And I think this kind of leads into the second law, which is you know the imitation uh, part, which is that you could like one of the first things you can do is take something that other people have done and just try to mirror it a little bit, right? Um, and I think that is, I think you know when when you have, I'm trying to, I can't quite figure out the way to express this. It's like when the output is like um, independent of the process that kind of led to it. Uh, that then I think it's this whole thing works right. So if you're talking mm-hmm. about a mo- like the movie can be viewed without ever knowing like who made it or you know how it was made or whether it was filmed in this country or that country. You know like you don't really mm-hmm. have to know those details. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the same for like a product. You know if you like have a car, like you know you can drive the car and whatever, and you can you can evaluate it. Um, and and so things like that, I think apply and it makes sense that you know this person the author he's like in marketing and he's talking about he's working with companies that are you know selling products right um and i think but i think it's it's i think it but i think it's useful to kind of contrast it with like getting people to produce data analyses or kind of produce good or bad data analyses um it shows the kind of the difficulty in in doing that compared to say building like learning how to build products yeah i mean well but i mean aren't they i don't know let me frame it this way and see if that agrees with you or disagrees, because I think I might lose the thread on your argument a little. But it's something around the lines of... So everyone watches movies. Most everyone watches movies. And you're right that it's only certain people who start to think, like, how did they achieve this effect? Like, that was a really cool thing. Like, you have to, like, observe it with this curious mind where you're actually interested about how they accomplish the things that they accomplish. So you start to notice, like, 
I don't know, like that that technique where you kind of like zoom in while the camera's rolling back. So it kind of oh, like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, like the vertigo with, effect, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so you would have someone who's like... So I think the interest to make movies has to be there. And then you start to observe them more technically. And then when you get to learning the technical skill, you already have this encyclopedic knowledge of what you want to achieve. So that learning the things that achieve, like, you'll be like, how do you do this? And, or, or like some, even if you're in a classroom setting, they'll be like, okay, now we're going to talk about how to do that. And you're like, oh yeah, I've wondered that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, maybe part of the, I mean, with kind of all academic subjects, you sort of start with like how to do it, even if you don't appreciate the outcome, which is sort of my qualm with the academic approach, especially to data science, where it's like, it would just feel so much more natural if you were someone who was like exposed to something a lot and you started to wonder how to achieve it and then you started to dig into how to achieve it and then you sort of build your knowledge of the field based on that right i think that can be done if you really narrow the context that the training is occurring it's a horrible sentence (laughs) (laughs) if you if you dramatically narrow the context in which training occurs right so it's imagine you came to school and they were like, and you, and and we told you, okay, you're gonna learn how to analyze data from clinical trial, randomized clinical trials for, you know, heart disease and this, right, or what, yeah. you, know, heart, you know, like then it's like, okay, well then you just look at all the clinical trials for that disease and see how they're done and see how they're analyzed, and it's like then you can really consume a lot. Yeah, I think. well, and there's a lot of data science classes or statistics classes that's like statistics for X, like statistics right. for doctors, and so those are people coming in from the field who want to get to know how to do things a little better. And then from statisticians, we're kind of like, oh, it's always like not as advanced topics. Like I, I don't know. I feel like there's kind of a bias against those types of classes, but. I guess I'm arguing that, in fact, I think that's where that's the most most like organic way of learning the field. Well, it's you know I think because like when you do that, you introduce a you introduce a, an element of standardization. Um, so like you so there's only so much variation that can exist if you're only looking at you know randomized clinical trials for myocardial infarction. You know, um, uh, I think to a certain extent, like even though movies are the, these kind of creative you know, a product, like there is quite a bit of standardization there, right? They're all kind of the same length. They all, you know, appear on a screen. They're all, you know, they're like there's a certain amount of there that is like you don't think about. Um, and I think if you just say data analysis, right, there's, you know, it's too much, mm-hmm. right? There's it's too, too many, much, yeah. You know, and I think there's no, you have every, all the pieces are moving all together as opposed to say fixing certain things and just looking at the variation along a narrow set of dimensions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like you have to do two levels. Someone who comes from it organically has to have two levels of abstraction. Like first they have to care about the field in the way I'm suggesting. Like you first have to care about the field. Then you have to care about the methods a little more for like doing the field better. And then you have to decide that you actually care about the methods the most and you want to learn more of the methods Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so versus, I mean, I think that would happen in any technical field where it's like you care about the movies and how they're made and then you like learn the technical skill and then you like develop a passion for broad applications of the technical skill. Right. But that's like, uh, yeah, you, you start to lose sight. I mean, I think one of my issues with the medical field or at least the part I was in not, I shouldn't even say the medical field, it's more like genetic field, is that like the levels of abstraction from people was like too much for me. (laughs) Because it's like, like when you get to like methods for dealing with variants in gene expression, that's really far from like, this person has cancer, can we solve it? (laughs) Can we like, like, you know, save their life? And so... I think I learned that that was too far, but there's tons of people who are super passionate there, and it's not like they've lost sight of the application either. So I just think so. I I guess in my mind, you know, the consumption phase that he talks about is really a a data collection phase, mm-hmm. whose which whose goal is to essentially build a model that describes the variation within you know this area. Yeah, and I think if there's just too much variation, then the, you can't build a model. That's a good way of putting it. 
Well, and, and again, I think what's hard with this field is that you're usually, most data scientists are operating at the level of caring about the variation of the technical skill and you lose sight of the variation of the field you're applying it to. And that disconnect, and like, I think that there's just kind of a, a personality trend of the people who get drawn directly to the technical variation, like, are kind of like, it's like a bummer for them to have to move to the, the like, application of it and understanding that more. Versus if you're passionate about the application, you can kind you can kind of do both. But then I notice myself, like, the more that I'm focused on the application of my work, which is kind of the field of fashion and, like, like I'm reading all sorts of books about fashion and the production, you know, line and what, like, like all the type of stuff um, on that side. And I've sort of, like, grown impatient with learning about new methods. Not that I don't care about them, but I'm just sort of, like, okay, give me what I need to know <laughs> to do this good enough. Or, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like the real impact I can have is, like, is, like, pushing the one standard deviation to the left on the curve of the application, right. not one standard deviation to the left on the methods. And I wish, I wish there was just a, like, maybe you need both people, especially to a mature company, but I just wish there were more people and maybe they're just not at conferences or whatever, but like, I just wish that there were more people on that first application, like passionate about that, standard deviation right. <laughs> or that curve yeah if we go into the second uh, law the imitation this is uh, he basically tells the story of like a model for storytelling i guess um so he talks about kurt vonnegut and how he kind of broke down stories into like i think it was at five or six like uh kind of patterns right yeah so he has like the actually i, I had heard of this before but i um I can't remember from where, <laughs> but how like, you know, he has like a, he, he's all these like kind of schematics where like the X axis is like the timeline of the story. And then the Y axis is if it's positive, it's good fortune. And if it's negative, it's ill fortune. And this is kind of like the timeline of like the protagonist of the main character. And it kind of goes up and down throughout the story. And there's like, you know, six different patterns in which I can go up and down. And, um, and, and the best one is the Kafka one that just right, goes, it's like, it's goes from down. bad to worse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like its own <laughs> category. And I like there's like an infinity there. Like it's just like infinitely bad, right? <laughs> exactly. God, that one's good. Yeah. I just like that it's like it isn't even – like even – even he just said it's Kafka. Like he didn't right, even yeah. try to generalize. It, it's it. like a it's like a one. There's only one person in that like cell, right? Like, just, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, the Cinderella one is good because it's like every Disney movie where you kind of you start off like poor and then you meet the prince, but then he like dumps you and then eventually he comes back or whatever. Like, well, you, you live know. happily ever after. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like. <laughs> Yes. Anyway, I guess Cinderella would have been a better example. <laughs> <laughs> You're like the like stepchild that everyone hates, and then you like go to the party, meet him, but then you have to run away. And then he tries to find you. And then he finds you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think you know, but if you have a model like this, right, then you can just kind of generate something from the model, right? And it probably won't be that great, but it'll be something. Right, mm -hmm. and yeah. I think, and then you kind of like that's actually quite useful. Like, I like, I think, like you know, when I was in school and I took a lot of music classes, like that's how you would learn composition, right? You learn the theory of like how Bach or you know Beethoven wrote their music, right? And here are the different patterns, right? And then they'd be like, okay, now now go write a Bach sonata or go write a Beethoven, you know, piano sonata or whatever. Oh, interesting. Wait, how, did you major in music in undergrad? No, I no, I just I just took like. A lot of courses. <laughs> yeah, clearly. That's, like, pretty advanced, I feel. I, I've never taken, like, a music composition class. Yeah, I mean, it's it, a lot of the initial stages are just, like, learn all the styles of, like, the old masters, right? And then and then produce a song in that style. So, and, and then you have to know, like, well, what does it mean to be in this style, right? And, like, and so you have to have, like, a model for, like, okay, well, these chords or these patterns or these melodies or whatever. And it, it, it works. Like, you get, like, all, everyone kind of, like, writes a little piano piece that's like sounds like beethoven it sounds like bad beethoven you know or whatever that makes my mind immediately go to i wonder if you could structure a data science class where it's like you choose five or six applications 
And then you're like, okay, make a paper, do an analysis that seems like an analysis for a medical journal, and then do one that seems like for a tech company or, you know? Yeah, like imagine, yeah, so like if you had like a, a new data set, or like a, here's a new data set in a medical study or whatever, and so analyze it as if it were, analyze it like a medical data analysis would look like or something. Right. Yeah, exactly. And like maybe you could use different, I think you would have to use different data sets because it's like, hey, make one in the style of an A-B test at a tech company. Like you couldn't use the same data necessarily. Um, but I don't know. That would be kind of, I, now I'm like, that's a great idea. Go do that, Roger. <laughs> I, well, I've, I, to be honest, I have thought of this and I just, I can't figure out a way I just I got I think I stumbled on the idea of like we need to just like focus on one area. Yeah. Right? And I think the problem is when I teach and this is probably a problem that I should not worry about, but I think I always worry that like I don't want to like index on one area so hard. Because like, well, what if someone doesn't care about that area? Like it's gonna be harder for them to do it, you know. Um but uh I think you do have to do that and then you can, you can see like here how here's how they do it typically. And then, like, maybe try to, and then he, so you can imagine, like, a, well, you read like five studies, right? And then, and then you say, okay, well, here's a new data set. Like, how would you, like, try to analyze it in the style of this, you know, area? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, in some ways, I feel like it's like homework problems or whatever. Like, I feel like maybe we loosely do that, but I feel like if you had a really ambitious class, and maybe it would have to be like a semester or even a year long, but I think you could do it where if you chose specific fields, where the data size was smaller and the the methods were a little less advanced, and then you 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 ramped up to like a a really like complex field with lots of methods. I like I think that you could potentially like I feel like you could simulate this where you start you kind of like teach some bare minimum number of methods first, and then you have people apply, and then every time you finish the analysis, you go over like, okay, what was hard? And let's like review this test. And like, cause that's kind of the best way of learning anyway. Right. According to my <laughs> like memory of one person saying at one time is like present the theory, then have people stumble on it and then present it again. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So I don't know. I think you should do it. Well, I think the advantage of this approach is that um, people essentially assemble the theory on their own. Right. Yeah. Because exactly. they they look at. I mean, yeah. Obviously, you would teach them some. You know, some. You'd have to teach them nuts and bolts about like, yeah. But they, by but. looking across like many different analyses, they can say, oh, well, this is what they always seem to have this table one, and they always seem to, you know, um, and uh, so they, it allows them to kind of generate that a little bit on their own, you know. Yeah, I like that. I feel like that would be a really cool course. <laughs> All right. And and you're the one who teaches, so you should do it and report back. <laughs> I'm just the ideas guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll come back one year from now, 25 episodes from now. We'll uh, yeah. see how it worked out. <laughs> Did you want to talk about law number three? Um, sure. Yeah, law number three. I like this one a lot. It was um, creative communities, and he talks about um, like Andy Warhol, for example, had um, I think it was called the Factory, or what was it called? Yeah, the, something industrial like that. It was uh, yeah, yeah, where he essentially just it was kind of like the first artist loft where it was like okay, he had this big space and people would come over and they would be able to like kind of debate methods and um like give each other feedback, like constructive feedback from other experts on like your technical skill or whether or not you're achieving kind of the emotional thing you want to achieve. And so it was just sort of these like melting pots of ideas. Um, and so I like this one a lot cause it's essentially like, it's sort of validating in terms of even this podcast of like, Hey, when you, you have someone to bounce ideas off of, you can evolve them farther. Um, and then also just kind of like, you know, this is why conferences are important or, you know, especially if you want to bounce technical ideas off of each other, that can just be really hard when you're isolated. And so cultivating these meetup groups and whatever is genuine, has a big function within the world. And then again, what I would argue is that you would also need, if you're like a very applied data scientist or statistician, 
you would also need to do that at the application level too. So like right. have people to bounce ideas off of, of like how you want to do a, an analysis for someone or how you think you should build a product that would be, that the clients would actually like, you know, and that's what I've been, that's what has been really fun for me at Stitch Fix is that I kind of get both of those. Again, I, I sort of ignore one. No, <laughs> that's not totally true. But. Well, I think the point is that you get both of those in the same building. Like, I mean, uh, so to speak, right? Like, it's every, it's all there in one place. Yeah. Which I think is a huge. I think the same is true for me here. Like, you know, uh, you even see the difference when you have like here, like on my hallway are, is a bunch of biostatisticians, right? But then, like on the other hallway is a bunch of like environmental health scientists, right? Totally. Oh, that's perfect for you. Yeah. You know, so like I could just kind of like walk down there and talk to someone about, you know, air pollution monitoring and then walk in the other direction. We talk about like, you know, time series models or whatever. I think that is, that's one of the advantages of like the way that our, just our physical, I mean, you know, what it, our way our building is structured. It's like everyone's kind of in one building. Yeah. And you see some of these other universities where like everyone's in different buildings and like it just, they don't they talk less it's just you know <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. yeah so there's a well it's kind of funny there's this like hbr harvard business review article that i only briefly skimmed but it was about how open offices essentially fail this like they thought that they were going to encourage all this like cross-pollination quote unquote, right. but it actually <laughs> fails because people just like put on their headphones and you know it's like people end up avoiding social contact because they're inundated with it. Um, And so, and like they suggest things like, you know, having, this is kind of a popular thing. It's like have lunches that you sign up for where you end up meeting someone new. Although the issue is that like all the nerds don't sign up for it, you know, (laughs) don't want to talk with anyone. (laughs) (laughs) And I, yeah, I get that. You know, it's like, It's hard to have, like, forced networking like that versus... And again, that's why I would argue that, like, trying to integrate with the application is so important. Because, like, otherwise, how are you going to... Like, you you yourself cannot seem so foreign that people don't want to interact with you. Or, like, don't think that they can interact with you about certain things. Like, that's why... I mean, I feel like I've talked about it on here before, but I really have, like, upped my fashion game since working at Stitch Fix. And, I mean, part of it's just that it's it's fun and I'm, like, learning about it. But also there's a, there's a sense that when I'm in a meeting, I just want to seem like one of them, you know? Right. So it's, yeah, I view it as important. Like, I actually, I was thinking about this a lot, talking with someone where I was like, I want to dress like I know what I'm doing, but I'm not trying to compete. You know, like I have, I have people who are, this is their life, you know? And so I'm never going to be as fashionable as them. And I don't want them to think that I'm trying to be, but I also want to come across as like, but I respect this field and I like, I know what I'm doing. Like I'm not. So anyway, yeah, (laughs) a little peek into Hillary's (laughs) corporate strategies. (laughs) Well, you know, it's funny, like, this is not exactly the same thing, obviously, but I did feel like, you know, when I came here, um, I definitely started dressing nicer. Um, yeah. And part oh of my god! Because yeah, people there dress really nice. Well, part of the problem is that, like I would say like half to seventy five percent of my meetings are in the medical school, right? Yeah. And every one of the you know all the physicians there when they see patients they dress nicely, which I think is appropriate, right? <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. And so a lot of the physicians you know they're coming from clinic or whatever, and so they're dressed kind of like they would normally dress. They're, it's not like a big deal for them, but it's way nicer than I would normally dress, right? And I just, you know, I feel like going to those meetings, like, you know, I just kind of felt like I had to kind of, you know, match them, you know, step up a little bit, you know? Totally. And I think, I mean, that it's funny because I think like the Mark Zuckerbergs are kind of that tech strategy of like the technical people wear hoodies and whatever, like that was kind of like a middle finger to that where it's like, I don't have to do that, you know? Right, right. And, and now people dress that way. I mean, there's a lot of women in tech who talk about kind of dressing that way to feel like you fit in with the engineers. And, and so I don't know. I like, I've always hated that. Like I'm, it's not beneath you to play the game. You know what I mean? Right. And, and I feel like there's, I think that you just, I feel like the people who, are dressed up they'll just feel that subconsciously if you're kind of like well i don't care about what you're doing or you know what i mean i don't know maybe that's too far but (laughs) it's (laughs) i don't know yeah i found it to be successful for me i mean i think i do a lot of 
conscious and subconscious things to sort of meet the business partners where they're at. Right. Um, and I had the exact same reaction at that school. This is the Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, Bloomberg School of Public Health, excuse yes. me. And so um, they, there's a lot of people there who are getting MPHs in like hospital administration. And so, and MPH is Masters of Public Health. So there's just a lot of people at that school who dress really formal every day or like what I would consider formal. Um, and so I remember feeling like, I don't think I was motivated enough to try to fit in, especially because I wasn't like, I wasn't necessarily meeting with these people all the time. Or if I was, I was, it, it was a more ad hoc consulting, not like a relationship building. But I just remember feeling out of place a lot. Um, so yeah, it was sort of interesting. Actually, I want to talk about you and personal, you, your experience, because I remember you we i think maybe even on this podcast i can't remember we talked about like doing tech in new york and doing tech in uh in san francisco mm, and how yeah. different it is um and uh i seem to recall you saying that you know if you want to do tech like you really kind of have to be in like it's really a lot better to be in san francisco yeah i mean that's that's a little harsh and i think that's changed i actually think that the cost of living in san francisco got so bad that tech companies are like facebook started to like emphasize their New York office or I don't I'm not totally sure how it all went but yeah I mean especially for data science which is like this two levels of abstraction okay <laughs> San Francisco is like I mean it's it's a great place if you want to do data science yeah and I think that I, I I think that geographical kind of proximity is uh I think it's difficult it's difficult to accept sometimes I think just because you want to feel like, well, you can do things remotely, you can do things in other places and or whatever. And but there's a certain amount of just like uh, density of people doing the same thing that is like a huge advantage, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I mean, I think that's part of why our podcast is popular. At least that's some of the, the feedback I feel like I've heard, which is that when you're isolated, you really are thirsty for someone to bounce ideas off of right and absent that at least you can hear people bouncing ideas off of each other right you know? yeah. and so yeah i totally agree and it's like it's ridiculous because i mean the price of living and i started to just think of san francisco and the bay area as a different currency like it's just like yeah like the numbers seem high but like the numbers for rent are high too like it's just ridiculous it's just like like when you call it cost of living, that doesn't even come close. It's just like, yeah, these are different dollars, and like the, ex <laughs> the exchange rate is really good for like the Midwest. But like, don't make the mistake. I mean, I think that's why you have so many people who make a lot of money in tech and then immediately move because they're like, let's capitalize on this exchange rate. Like, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, so that's like really tough. Like, it's not. We've sort of like hyper done it. It's too bad there's not more distributed community, right? But. Yeah, I think I wonder if that's how possible that is. Just because, like, I feel like this is a tough thing to break because it's like a does like a it's like a collect it's almost like a collective action kind of thing. Like you can't uh, you, you, if you you know if people you can't like just move out on your own. Like like if everyone moved out all together, that would be one thing, right? But right. If yeah. one person moves out, then that person's just at a disadvantage. <laughs> I've talked to someone who was like trying to rally, like like explicitly mentioned the idea of like rallying a bunch of friends to move all move somewhere else in order to take the pressure off, but still have like their community. <laughs> <laughs> Create like a commune out in the woods somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Or like just all move to you know somewhere like Indianapolis or something but <laughs> so anyway no I, and maybe the more data science comes becomes prevalent that will change but yeah and you see it with universities too i mean there's just a few dominant ones in in statistics like yeah well you look at a place like boston and you know, how many universities there are in one city exactly uh and uh you know it's different from like other other areas where there's one you know one university kind of within the next 200 miles or whatever you know so mm-hmm Totally, yeah. So the last chapter is kind of where I kind of fell off a little bit. <laughs> no, I guess I didn't. There's nothing I particularly disliked. I guess I just kind of didn't find it quite as interesting. He mostly talks about like getting feedback and collecting data, and um, and, he I, about, and the example I love is it's like Ben and Jerry's. Like <laughs> I, I enjoyed the Ben and Jerry stuff. That was like. That seemed yeah. really cool, actually. <laughs> yeah, they talk about how they develop new uh, flavors there. 
even though I'm on my whole sugar, like anti sugar thing, it still is fun. <laughs> yes, right. You, yeah. Um, go on though. I feel like I cut you off. No, no, no. I mean, I didn't really I had much more to say except that like I just didn't find this chapter. I think maybe because it was like the closest to like what I do. Um, I think I just didn't find it quite as interesting. I mean, I also think it was a, a way of quickly summarizing what we've talked about a ton with the design work where it's like this is more talking about the design process of like iterating quickly and constructive thinking right. you know what I, like i feel like it's ground we've covered to some degree um i agree that i didn't leave this one like oh i think about i mean i actually do think about the ben and jerry's example a lot especially they talk about some like pickle ice cream yeah yeah yeah, where they're like, this was an amazing flavor, but they're like, yeah, the world's just not ready for it. And especially living in San Francisco, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of like weird ice cream here, you know? Like there's Salt and Straw, which is actually a Portland company, but either way, they have like crazy flavors where it's like, in October, they have uh, like blood pudding and it's actually got like blood in it, or, you know. <laughs> so it's like, it's like, like here we're at the bleeding edge of ice cream, you know, <laughs> acceptable. Like pickle ice cream would not bat an eye here. Right. But, but Ben and Jerry's isn't looking for those customers. They're looking for like average Joe's across. Well, America. they're not looking for like the, the, the San Francisco market. They're looking at like a global market, right? So. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think that example sticks out in my mind. Because it's like, it's not quite the point he was trying to make in the chapter, but it was like, oh, this is a really good example that I can latch on to of like, here's where we are versus here's where the audience is. And so you have to kind of override. Like if I talk to someone here about it, they're like, oh, no, that would be fine. I'm like, yeah, but remember, <laughs> like, like Ben and Jerry's isn't salt and straw, right? right. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, but yeah, I, I think the the fourth iteration is essentially like, all the applications of design thinking we talked about previously. Like you okay. learn from doing and blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. There was one point that I actually think was kind of, it was in law one, but it didn't feel, I can't actually remember now how this flowed. I'm sure it made sense at the time, but I really liked it and I use it. I feel like I need to dig into the primary literature on this, but he basically was saying that, you have like aha moments come from your right brain um, where your left brain is like the very analytical function where you're kind of reasoning through things. And he has, he has a really good example of like kind of a brain teaser and the two ways like that he presents a brain teaser and then he's like, you probably either the idea just popped in your head, like the answer popped in your head, or you started going through really methodologically, like iterating through word. It was something about words. And like, and so right. you start iterating through and being like, does that one make sense? Does that one make sense? And so it was a way of illustrating like the iteration kind of methodological approach is your left brain processing. And then if the idea just pops in your head, that's sort of right brain. Um, and then he talks about how... You essentially need to like, like ideas come out of your, because it's not the verbal center, the right brain ideas like only bubble up if they're fairly fully formed Right. versus left brain ideas. Like you're, you're more like conscious of the development process because it is the verbal center. And, and then he talks about how like, you know, the reason why there's shower moments is because those are moments when your left brain is quieted down right. and then ideas from the right brain can kind of pop out. Um, so again, this is his summary, and I'm sure that there's like good neuroscience and like, I don't know, like actual things I could read, but that really was aligned with the types of things I'm trying to push with like meditation, for example, mm -hmm. where it's, it's like ways of cultivating the ability to quiet your analytical brain and like kind of the creative output that I've had has really increased as a result of that or like and my confidence in it and you know it's just like I feel like it really aligned with my experience as well as why I feel it's so important to push things like meditation um like literally is like you'll be better at your job you'll be a better listener and you'll be a little more capable of 
not shutting down your own ideas and you'll even have them bubble up. Like I've had, I've had so many aha moments when I'm meditating. Um, and you can't, I, I caveat that with, you can't go into it with that goal. I think that can be, that can lead to like very frustrating meditation. <laughs> <You> <laughs> sabotage it. Yeah. So it's not, that's not, and then you're like criticizing yourself or you're disappointed. It's not happening. You know, it's just, that's the, that's like the number one thing that they are like, don't do that. Um, but at the same time, I think I think the reason why I push all that stuff so much is that we're a field that's so over-indexed on the analytical thinking, right? And we don't appreciate the function of those, like the creative center of your brain. So that's my soapbox for that part. <laughs> I just had a, I don't know about you. I just have two more notes, uh, just kind of randomly from the book um wait i need i need reassurance that that was like a profound (laughs) oh did you have that reaction to that part or yeah no i that's exactly how i kind of interpreted it i guess okay cool yeah Yeah. sorry (laughs) i'm just trying to be honest my lack of disagreement was it was agreement i guess yeah yeah yeah. i'm just telling you my needs and you responded appropriately i understand i appreciate yeah (laughs) anyway (laughs) moving on uh (laughs) uh, so i i highlighted just two quotes one was uh he says like you know the truth is when people talk about creativity they're usually talking about creative output that is widely adopted and or accepted um and i think and i think related to that is later on he talks about this study that was done by this guy whose name is so long that i can't even I'm never going to try to pronounce it. Um, uh, well, maybe I'll just... Sixent Mihaly, I guess? Anyway, he says that... And he, he did it like a cohort study of like people, and kind of creative people who went to art school, I think. Um, and he said, young artists who left their mark on the world tended to be those in addition to who, origi- who, 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 in addition to originality, also had the ability to communicate their vision to the public, often resorting to public relations tactics that would have been abhorrent in the pure atmosphere of the art school. And I think, and I think the two ideas come together in the sense that, like, I think it's tempting to think of this like creative curve as like a passive, like phenomenon where it's like you just like land on the curve at the right place, then like the roller coaster will just kind of take you for a ride. Um, but there is like an active component, which is that of this idea of kind of like promoting your idea and to, to get it to the point where it's widely accepted, or um, you know, uh, well, to where it's widely accepted, basically. Yeah, I, I'm glad you pointed that out because absolutely, and that's that's the type of work that this field abhors. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's does not just uh, uh, related, not just confined to art schools, I suppose. Huh? Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, you hear artists talk about that. You hear authors talk about that. Like, I think that the cult of personality for authors is like toxic or it just i've i've read from time to time especially related to um there's the woman i think it's like i, f- I want to say like elena ferrante or something yeah i recognize that name yeah yeah who um it's a it's a pseudonym um and she's produced these like books that are widely beloved you know like really good books but I think I'm not sure. I God, did she get exposed? Or I I can't remember. But I, I actually think that was that's her real name. I I think I think the pseudonym is something else. Are you sure? Well, well. Anyway, she whatever. Went, the name, yeah. the, her real name was exposed. It was yeah. Oh okay yeah. But I think that the I don't know if she said something at that point or maybe I'm just making this up and associating it with the wrong person. But essentially saying like I did not want to play this cult of personality game. Like right. it just I was I didn't want to do it. And and like same with um. The woman who, J.K. Rowling, she, she like, wrote some books under a pseudonym as well for the same reason, I think. Right. Or, like, wanted to get, like, an organic reaction outside of this author praise thing. So, yeah, you hear about it with writing, obviously with artists. Uh, it's it's sort of like this double-edged sword. Totally, and, yeah. Yeah, and then and it's just, it sucks because if you're good at it, then people will, like, get almost immediately get jealous and start questioning like did you really do anything you know it's like yeah it's it's uh it's an ugly part of the game i get it's it's an important it's an important part in the sense that if you do want your eyes to ideas to be out there it's unlikely to just kind of happen all by itself yeah like you have the if you want it to happen you have to do it but then 
I mean, maybe there's just, it's like, it's like we just need to talk about it more. There's a lot of naivete around it. And so a lot of people do believe, like, if you just do this right, it'll happen. Right. And, and you do see examples of that. But at the same time, it's like, it's like hiding this entire aspect of the work. Well, I think that's, that's what the, this book is about, right? Like, in a sense uh-huh. that like, you don't see that. Like, every story that he tells is about how you don't see all that stuff kind of well, you, all the work that kind of comes before, right? I mean, mm-hmm. totally, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. It's like the favorite, my favorite example because I just love this movie is the movie Amadeus, where he there's a scene, one of like the many pivotal scenes is he's sort of looking through Mozart's music, and it's like they were he didn't even have drafts; it was like all originals and no like he right. just like wrote it perfectly. But then in and this is Salieri, but then in actuality, he like describes how Mozart actually did have tons of drafts and iterated and like and like was friends with Salieri and like worked with him. It, it, it right, was right, like right. totally different. Like basically everything <laughs> in the movie was wrong. <laughs> right, <laughs> but it's such a good movie. I don't I don't care if it's it is wrong. it is a great movie. Like who cares? Yeah, the historical yeah. part, whatever. But it, I love that movie. Yeah. Oh my god. God, you will be so jealous. I got to see that with the San Francisco Symphony. Oh, they like the played score. it. Yeah, oh. it was so good. <laughs> yeah, I look forward for that. I bought the tickets a year in advance. So wow, like, okay. I'm ready. <laughs> it's so good. It's like the perfect. They do that for other movies, but this was like the perfect movie to do oh. it for. Um, yeah. Well, you should feel lucky that you have a, a working orchestra. Yeah. Wait, Baltimore does too, right? Well, they were on strike for a little while. They're on now. Oh, okay. But uh, they only have like a one-year contract, so they might go back at the end of the year. Oh, oh that's sad. It, it yeah. is sad, but isn't it's that like, where you met your wife? Well, we don't. We didn't play in the Baltimore City. <laughs> no, but you were like both at a concert. No, we 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 met because we both played in the Johns Hopkins Symphony. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, I misunderstood that. That's there was nice. a, there was yeah. a symphony involved. <laughs> yeah, your music. It's so unusual. I mean, I think there are people who are have like fairly passionate art applications in addition to statistics but it's not like super common music and statistics yeah i don't know i haven't i'm I'm not sure i think there's that's probably more common than you think yeah maybe but you're like i mean you were essentially like a practicing musician well that was many years ago though so yeah (laughs) he stopped since then (laughs) (laughs) and you play the violin that's what what everyone can know now i love everyone loves that instrument I do too. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, that was a sidetrack. Yeah. <laughs> oh well, actually, I mean that's another. That's like another intro. Like this is like a whole spiel I have that probably reveals too much. But let's hear it. it it's like uh, it took me a while to learn that real life is not like movies. <laughs> it's like, wait, wait, it's not. <laughs> I, I know, I know, it's horrible. But it's like, I remember having those thoughts as an adult, even, where it's like, oh, yeah, that's not how it works. And, like, that's an interesting thing because, like, art is ultimately meant for entertainment, not as, like, educational lessons, right? But then I think that if you're, if you grow up with movies, you know, and maybe that's a newer phenomenon, I don't know, but it, it like, like, the idea that the, they would have taken, like, dramatic, uh, artistic liberties with um, the movie Amadeus like that's a normal thing for an artist to do and that's okay but it's true that there's like the social consequence of everyone thinking that's actually how it went so right, right, yeah. it's a difficult yeah I don't know what the right answer is Like, well, at what point did you figure out that uh, life isn't like the movies <laughs> it's been a slow <laughs> I mean I definitely think through college I think it was after college probably in grad school <laughs> yeah. when I was all depressed <laughs> isolated no I mean especially like rom-coms I, that's so naive but it's, yeah. again I, I like that's the Mindy project have you ever seen that show yeah yeah I love that that's show. like the first that's like her, in the pilot she talks about watching rom-coms all of the time and right. thinking that's how things are gonna go <laughs> right. so I know at least like there's one other fictional character who <laughs> who's with you yeah. yeah, but anyway, I mean, it's not like it was that logical or thought out, but I don't know if it's, it's definitely, you get like infinite more exposure to on-screen relationships, like the guts of them than you do in real life, right? Yeah. So yeah. I was thinking er- like earlier, 
like a month ago, I was talking. I was thinking about how there are certain th- like fields where it's like easy to demonstrate your talent early on, um, and I think one of those is like arts, uh, like music or music, yeah, or performing absolutely. arts. Yeah. Where like you know we often recognize people as good or bad you know, pretty early, uh, uh, and, and the other one is sports. I think um, where like not every sport, but some sports you can be like, oh, that person's really talented, or that person has like a knack, a knack for whatever, you know. And I because I was talking to someone who who uh, I was talking to Betsy Ogburn who lives in Philadelphia, and she went to the Philadelphia Symphony, and she was talking about the performance, and I, and I remember it, like it triggered in my brain that like. The principal horn player was, was this woman that I went to like summer camp with, you know, when, oh, I, cool. when I was like twelve. Yeah. Was and, it music summer camp? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember thinking at the time, oh yeah, she, like that that person, she was an amazing French horn player at that time at age like, yeah, you know, I, maybe we were fifteen. I think it was a little older. We were, and um, at that time, I thought she was amazing. Like she is going to be amazing, and like yeah. lo and behold, she's like the principal horn player for the Philadelphia Orchestra. You know, it's like at the peak of her profession, um, and it's a bit. I think it's like it's interesting how like for that kind of thing, like it's it feels like it's more predictable than for say like oh that person's going to be a great lawyer or you know yeah, <laughs> or, I don't yeah. know I have to try to think, or statistician for that matter you know right yeah well part of it's that you start doing it so much younger for sure but right. I know exactly what you mean my dad and I were talking about this once where he had someone in his school who it was just like oh that that will be one of the ones like that's like clearly it's just like like many orders of magnitude better than everyone else like at a very young age and then it was like a sad story because it was one of those total like the teacher had an inappropriate relationship, you know, just yeah. like that, that happens a lot too <laughs> to these people. Cause they, well, cause, and, they, and I think they stand out, they stand out and then they get cultivated. And then the people who cultivate them, like what are their motivations, you know, it's right, like, exactly. it gets yeah. ugly. Yeah. And so, um, I, and I feel like you, you hear a lot of back and forth about this. Cause it's like, there's a lot of social things. Like if you're identified as talented, then you're going to get more attention and you have more confidence and then you like practice more, you know, it's right. There's a feedback it's not like loop it's there. In a, yeah. There's a big feedback loop. Um, so it's not totally clear. And actually I'm glad you brought that up because in this book, he talks about someone who um, learned to be like a great artist as an adult um, where the guy just literally, right. it's, it's like he decided like, this is the lifestyle I want to be an artist, right? which yeah. is kind of a bizarre choice. But anyway, and so he just, he, and then he somehow like tracked it all online, um, where he was like, here's my first picture. And he had like something like a picture a day or I, I don't right. know, but he had a, a comparison of the two, like his, one of his first things. And then one of his much later things than you can totally tell. And actually, I'm also glad you brought that up because that's where they talk about purposeful practice, which right. is another one of these paradigm shift type things for me, where it's just like, oh, yeah, you need to actually, you can't just do something a lot. You have to be like constantly trying to learn while you're doing it. Um, so I guess, yeah, like that's an example of, it's, I guess what it is is like, let's say it was all nurture it's still hard to like catch up as an adult to someone who's been cultivated since a super early age. Right. And so it took someone basically like quitting his job and he like had to move to Iowa to go to some like, you know, program that was, yeah, like some commune or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. It was like a very, it was like a apprenticeship type situation. And so, yeah, like, I, but he tells the story to be like, don't be discouraged if you're not one of these child geniuses. Like, it's, you know, you can do it. I, I agree with that. I think, um, I, honestly, I think kids, like, start music way too early. <laughs> yeah, but, right. Um, oh, I saw do. this. Oh, my gosh. I saw this, like, it was it was on Union Square, and it was a bunch of, like, really little kids, and they were playing amazing chamber music, okay. like, on the street. I mean, it was, like, really, like, fantastic, and I just had such, like, a sinking feeling in my stomach about yeah, it, because I yeah. was, like, that's, a, like, impressive, but also, oh, my God, it's, like, child labor or something. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. yeah, anyway. But, actually, there was one more of the point I wanted to make, uh, which your story, with the, you know, the story about the painter kind of reminded me of which is that like i think all of the examples that he gives you know are are areas where there's kind of an established set of aesthetics that allows you to determine what's good and what's not good 
right? So like you think about the guy yeah. learning to paint, you know, it's very easy for him to get feedback if, or he can judge himself. This is good. Maybe this is not so great. This is better. Or this is worse. And, and, he, and he would post these like on, I think it was like a Reddit forum um, where people would say, hey, you know, that's really great. Or, hey, you need to work on this or, you know, because there's like an established set of aesthetics. And I think if you were to make a movie or you to do photography or whatever, like you could, people can fall back on, okay, here's our definition of what's good and what's not good. Um, and I think that's the thing we don't have, or it's lacking, I think, in data analysis. Like if I do a data analysis, like, you know, how do I judge whether it's good or bad, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think the one place where you're starting to see that is like the journalism, data analysis for journalism and like data visualization. But then that's that's very far from the type of thing you would do in a much more applied setting. But I do think it gives a kind of like very forward thinking, like here's what an amazing visualization looks like. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's the only... I mean, again, maybe we're just talking about audiences, though. Like, that's a part of the reason it works is because it's like, okay, this is like truly what the average New York Times reader finds compelling. <laughs> and that is a very different audience than if you're, especially if you're in like academia. And so maybe one day like, <laughs> this will be appropriate in this application or I don't know. I'm just, I'm just spitballing here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I had one more profound point to make while you were like a, talking about the, um, like people giving you feedback on whether or not it's good. Oh, but yeah. I I totally lost it though. But anyway. Do you have any other <laughs> notes on your on the book? No, but I'm 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 glad we had this episode cuz it's I mean it's like a longer episode and I still feel like I could talk about this for hours, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. I it, it just yeah, it's super interesting to try to figure out like to break down what we mean by creative creativity and data analysis in a good way, in a like a structured way. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs>